In this video, I will break down the schematic of my smart home sensor. I will explore the best practices for connecting peripherals to the ESB32. Picking the right pins can be tricky. So basically, I just connect everything to the GPIOs, right? No, that's not how it works. A lot of pins have special requirements or special behavior. During boot, some of the pins output signals. Other pins need to have a certain state. So you need to be very careful. This video is about how I try to navigate through these requirements and hopefully it will help you with your own projects. Also, I didn't yet purchase the PCB. If you find any error, please let me know in the comments down below because it's not too late. If we take a look at the GPIOs of ESP32, you see that there are some gaps. Um, some pins are not exposed. And for example, GPIO 6 to GPIO 11 are connected to internal memories, so you shouldn't use them. But that's by far not the only problem. So the first thing we need to talk about is pins that output signals during boot. You can still use them, but you need to expect that during boot, they will output signals. So for example, you shouldn't directly connect it to an output because this can damage your components. The second thing is strapping pins that require a certain state in order for the ESB to boot into the right mode. So for example, GPIO 0 needs to be low if you want to flash the firmware to the ESB. However, if you don't want to flash the firmware, if you just want to run the firmware that is on it, then it must not be low. <laughs> so you need to be careful with these states. There are also four pins that can only be used as input, which is not terrible, but you need to be aware. As far as I know, the rest of the pins are safe to use. However, as I already mentioned in the last video, I'm going to use Olimax ESP32 PoE as basis for this project. So it will have Ethernet communication. And Ethernet requires a lot of pins. Some of the pins are reserved for programming. I could technically reuse them, but it makes things complicated. And so I will dedicate them to the programming interface. There are a lot of pins that are used for Ethernet communication. So if you take all of this into consideration, there isn't much left. And so I need to be very careful with assigning these pins because I have a lot of stuff that I would like to connect. So first, let me quickly show you the schematic. This is the original schematic from Olimax and I will quickly show you what's on it. Let me start with the power supply. We have a battery charger. Now it supports a lithium polymer battery, which is pretty nice, but I don't need it. So I removed the circuit. Then we have the whole ethernet support, which I kept. This is for data communication and there is also the power over ethernet circuit which has a buck converter which transforms the high PoE voltage to 5 volts. I also kept that one. A USB to UART chip which I removed. I will just expose the UART pins and then attach a USB adapter if I want to program one of the sensors and then I remove it again. It's just used to program it. So it can be external. Um, then we have of course the ESP32 room module. Some buttons, an SD card which I removed, extension pins which I removed and this connector which I also removed. And then we have some fiducials 
fiducials are used as guidance system for the pick and place machine on the PCB. And then we have some mounting holes. I added a 12 volt linear regulator because the current that will flow is very low and so I don't need a step down converter. This is just for the smoke alarm and it's consuming very little current. All right, the power supply is also simplified because I removed all of the battery charging circuits and I just kept the buck converter for 3.3 volts. And I will also remove this LED because we don't need an LED glowing 24 seven. Doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, ESP module. Yeah. I think I can also remove the reset button because if I want to reset this sensor, I will just unplug it and then plug it back in and it works. I added a programming interface. I will use GPIO2 as infrared transmitter. It needs to be floating or low to be able to flash the ESP32. That's why I'm using it for this circuit right here. It has a pull down resistor and this way it's kept low during boot. It also has an integrated pull down resistor so it shouldn't be necessary but still I will put it in there. Now, if GPIO2 is high, it will turn on the transistor and this in turn will enable all of the infrared LEDs. Next is the noise detector. I didn't want to integrate the whole module because I want to save some space. And that's why I rebuilt the schematic of this noise detector. And the second reason is there is a potentiometer inside. And this potentiometer is used to set the threshold. And I don't want to manually change the threshold for all of my sensors. And that's why I'm using a digital potentiometer so I can remotely change the threshold level of the sensor. GPIO5 is used for the data line of my I2C bus. It will output some PVM during boot and it must not be low which is perfectly suitable for the data line because um, random data on the data line doesn't harm anyone as long as the clock line isn't involved. And for the clock line, I'm using GPIO 13. And so everything should be fine. Pin 14 will be connected to the speaker. In case you're wondering about this stuff right here, the speaker should be turned on if GPIO 14 becomes high because then we have 3.3 volt here and also around 3.3 volt here. And this is enough to turn on this transistor right here, which in turn uh, turns on the speaker. However, I would also like to have a backup plan. So in case my ESP32 crashes for some reason, which um, yeah shouldn't happen, but if it does, I still want my smoke alarms to make noise. And so I can directly inject the 12 volts from my smoke alarm directly into the gate. And then with this voltage divider, I make sure that doing so doesn't break my ESP32. I'm not using GPIO 15, so I have one spare um, GPIO, although it's a very picky one. However, I'm using pin 16 as UART transmit pin for my CO2 sensor. GPIO 32 will be my infrared receiver. GPIO 33 will be my DHT22. And I just realized that I'm missing a resistor right here because I need, I need a resistor right here between my data line and my supply voltage. 
10k. All right. It's always a great idea to make videos about schematics because it forces you to look at your schematic again. Smoke detector. Yeah, the smoke detector is a tricky one. It requires 12 volts and that's why I added this 12 volt linear regulator, as I already mentioned. The output signal will also be 12 volts. It has a relay inside and technically I could also use 3 volts, but I try not to mix 12 volts with 3.3 volts because if you connect something wrong then it instantly breaks. And so I'm using 12 volts and I'm using a voltage divider to get the signal. Next is the movement. So this is my movement sensor. It will be connected to GPI 35. The CO2 sensor's transmit pin will be connected to my receive pin and the receive pin can be input only. And the last thing is the light dependent resistor. So there is a light dependent resistor that will output an analog voltage and that needs to be converted with an analog digital converter. Therefore, I will use the GPI 39. And this is basically it. So you also find my programming interface right here. I will also integrate GPIO zero to the programming interface because it needs to be low for flashing and for normal operation it needs to be high. And that's why there is a pull up resistor. All right, I will get rid of the reset button because if I want to reset the sensor, I just unplug it and that's it. If this video was helpful, please like and subscribe. If you found a mistake in my schematic, please let me know in the comments down below. I'm very thankful for your comments. If you know someone who might be interested in this stuff, please share my video. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.